Hello, my name is Debbie Doyle. I'm the meetings manager here at the American Historical Association. Thank you for attending our panel, 50 Years of Bangladesh, which is part of the AHA Colloquium series of Virtual AHA. Uh, this session is joint with the Society for Advancing the History of South Asia. We're excited to have you join us and I'm looking forward to a productive discussion. I would like to thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. You can support Virtual AHA and other AHA activities by joining the AHA, or if you're already a member, making a donation today. We'll post links with details in the chat at the end of the session today. A few logistical things to cover before we start the webinar. By registering for or participating in the AHA's webinars, participants and panelists agreed to abide by the AHA's Code of Professional Conduct. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions to the presenters. We hope to address all relevant questions, but need to be mindful of the time, so we may paraphrase or combine questions. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation on social media, remember to use the virtual AHA hashtag. Finally, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording on the AHA's YouTube channel in the next week or two. I will now turn things over to the chair, Tariq Omar Ali from Georgetown University. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Debbie. Um, and welcome everyone to the panel, 50 Years of Bangladesh, Tracing Law, Literature and Liberty in Transition. Um, I'm just gonna take a few minutes at the beginning to introduce the speakers. Um, then the presenters uh, will present their papers and um, I'll have a brief, very brief sort of summing up of the discussion at the end. And then we'll open it up to questions and answers from you. I think any event on uh, marking that I means this is a great opportunity to have a sort of a public discussion of Bangladesh history, right? To draw in larger audiences than we would. And all of us would like to devote the most time possible um, to engaging with the audience um, here from wherever you may have joined. Um, so let me, I'm gonna introduce the speakers in the order in which they're going to speak. Um, Ohona Panda will speak first. Ohona is a postdoctoral teaching fellow in the humanities at the University of Chicago. She is currently working on a monograph titled Nation versus Nation State decolonization and the politics of language that re-examines the Hindu-Muslim relationship in Bengal through a political history of language. Um, our second speaker will be Manav Kapoor. Manav is a lawyer and a PhD student at Princeton University. He is working on evacuee property and property rights on the eastern and western flank of the Indo-Pakistan border between 1947 and 1965. And um, his work examines how control over property shaped India and both flanks of Pakistan in this immediate post-partition period. Our final speaker will be Cynthia Farid. Cynthia is a Bangladeshi lawyer. Um, so we have two lawyers in the panel and Ohana and myself are the only non-lawyers. Um, so, you know, we're balancing it out. Cynthia Farid is a Bangladeshi lawyer and a visiting scholar at the University of Wisconsin Law School. Her doctoral dissertation was titled Imperial Constitutionalism, Judicial Politics in Colonial India, 1861 to 1935. It examined the nature of governance in British India under the rubric of imperial constitutionalism, shaped by changes in property law, race relations, and other professional and institutional interests that accompanied the political and economic restructuring of the colonial state. She is currently working on a co-authored monograph on the Constitution of Bangladesh, which is, uh, which is um, coming out with Heart Publishers in early 2023. Um, so with that, I'll turn over to our first speaker, Ohana. Thank you, Tariq, for the introduction. Um, so my paper is uh, called Language as a Parliamentary Question in East Pakistan, the Nature of Bangladeshi Linguistic Nationalism. And um, the language movement in East Pakistan is usually seen as the first major expression of Bengali linguistic na nationalism against the Pakistani state, which had tried to introduce Urdu as a sole state language of Pakistan. Bengali Pakistanis raised the demand that Bangla be made one of the state languages. And after a series of debates and deliberations, the movement culminated on 21st February, 1952, when Pakistani police opened fire on protesting students at Dhaka University, killing a number of them. The language movement from 1947 to 1956 has been seen as the moment in which a distinct form of resistance against the Pakistani state emerges through the language question. The foremost historian of this period, Odruddin Umar, 
linked the language movement to the polit political economy of freshly partitioned Bengal. In this crucial reading, language emerged as a metonym for the social, economic, and political discontent in East Bengal after 1947, acting as a powerful conduit for peasant disillusionment. Now, I came to study the language movement after 1947, not by approaching it going backwards from 1971, but as a refusal to think about 1947 as an end to the Hindu-Muslim political relationship that I studied in colonial India. More specifically, since I studied Hindu-Muslim pol politics in Bengal through a history of language, I wanted to push it further into the post-colonial period and in the new nation states in order to better understand the politics of language that surrounds uh, Bengali. In this short paper, I focus on one single meeting of the East Bengal Legislative Assembly uh, that happened on the 8th of April, 1948, and two speeches given on that occasion by um, Dhirendranath Dotto and by uh, Hobibullah Bahar Chaudhary. Um, now, the first speech by Dhirendranath Dotto uh, kind of referenced uh, an earlier um, speech that he had given uh, in, on March uh, 25th at the Constitu Constituent Assembly in Karachi. Um, and he specified uh, that Bengali be adopted as the official language of East Bengal, replacing English, becoming the medium of instruction in educational institutions and the subject of competitive examinations, and that it be the language on forms of state communication, such as uh, telegraphs, postal articles, etc. In his speech, Dotto emphasizes a position that clearly links the question of language with that of the state, um, and in the very terminology of uh, the Rashtra Bhasha, that is state language, Pradeshik Bhasha, provincial language, and official language, we understand language as a civic issue in which the state is clearly linked or coupled with language in order to better serve the people. And otherwise, um, the state has literally become um, illegible to the people. Um, now, shortly after Dhirendunath's speech, uh, the Minister of Health, Hobibullah Bahar Chaudhary presented a different kind of argument about the necessity of introducing Bangla as one of the state languages of Pakistan. Um, in his earlier life, he was a writer, journalist, and editor in Undivided Bengal. And at one time, he played football for uh, Mohammedan Sporting Club. And um, to lovers of literature and literary history, he also edited the journal uh, Bulbul with his sister. And in the 1940s, um, he was also an active member of the literary organization, East Pakistan Renaissance Society. Um, so Hobibullah Bahar appealed directly to Khaja Nazimuddin, then chief minister, in an appeal that introduced a different uh, temporality altogether, um, that of literature and literary history. He said um, that, Khwaja Shahib has allowed the proposal of raising Bengali literature to the status of state language in the Ain Shaba. Historians of Bengali literature will not forget this, thus placing uh, the obdurate Najmuddin in a continuum of great patrons of Bengali literature, such as Hussein Shah, Nasr Shah, Paragol Khan, Chuti Khan, and surprisingly, Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee at the end of that list. Um, Hobibullah Bahar's rhetorical uh, move signaled a temporal shift and this shift and its attendant blurring of chronologies within the domain of language marked a different political formation, um, that of the Jati. Um, and I uh, gloss or translate the Jati as people, though it, it has also been translated more commonly as, as nation. Um, so instead of being squarely located in the present, Hobibullah Bahar's lecture provided an account of the historical evolution of the Bengali language and its literature, by talking about linguistic patronage within medieval courts, Hobibullah Bahar's evocation of Jati evoked a community that though located in a distant medieval past was neither exclusionary nor autocratic. This is crucial because he located this utopian conception of the people and the Jati, the Jonagon, and the democratic colloquial language fought by them in history within the contemporary politics of Pakistan. Um, so I'm not going to talk about his speech in great detail, and I have some excerpts uh, on my slide. Um, but to, to just talk about it a little bit, 
He highlights the Muslim patronage of vernacular poets, uh, both Hindu and Muslim, and cites the poetry of medieval poets such as Kriti Bash, Chundi Dash, Bidaputi, and Vijay Gupto, who had immortalized the Muslim king Nasrat Shah, Sultan Hussein Shah, and Chuti Khan in their poetry, citing a verse by Bidaputi that pays tribute to Nasrat Shah's Goreshwar, Habibullah declares that Islam is a democratic religion, a revolutionary religion. Therefore, the followers of Islam has naturally given Bengali, the languages of the masses, a place in the court. Um, the courts of the 14th to 16th centuries had also trans arranged the translation of the Hindu epics, uh, Mohabharata and Ramayana, when Brahmin scholars had condemned the vernacular. It was Islam that had accommodated the voice and language of the people and was thus inherently a democratic and revolutionary religion. Muslim rulers had also favored the people's language thus over Brahminical knowledge production. Again, he cites philologist Dinesh Chandrashen to establish that folk poems such as Gitikatha and Polygon were the people's poetry and stood in direct opposition to the production of the Hindu Shastrakars. The subject matters of this poetry included lower caste protagonists, inter-ethnic and inter-religious love, and women expressing autonomy by choosing their own husbands. This then was the literature of people and the literature of revolt. It grew out of the support provided by Muslim rulers. Now, Hobibullah Bahar's argument departs considerably from Dotto's emphasis on the civic functions of language. On first analysis, he presents the inherent claim that Bengali Muslims lay on the Bengali language. This was, of course, a recurrent theme across the early 20th century against culturally hegemonic Hindus and also emerged as a key separatist argument within the Pakistan movement by ideologues of the East Pakistan society. Um, and and the, the third quote, in, in fact, on the slide is, is a direct kind of verbatim reproduction of a uh, speech given by the philologist Muhammad Shoidullah in 1918 um, at the uh, meeting of the Bombay Musharman Shahid Pashamati. Um, but to go back to uh, how he's different from uh, Dotto, so he, he differs uh, considerably on the civic functions of language. Um, and, and the second and more interesting conceptual formulation of the political function of language is um, that he says, the history of literature of the Indian subcontinent is the history of the opposition between Obhijata Tantra, which I translate as, oligar as oligarchy, and Gano Tantra, uh, democracy. Um, and this is a recasting of the political history of South Asia through a history of language politics. By positing a binary between elite language and the people's language across centuries, Obibula Bar tells his fellow legislators, especially those with excessive faith in the central government, that language is and has always been key to formulating popular and moral sovereignty. Thus, Pakistanism is not simply a claim to territorial sovereignty, but is imbued with a moral claim by the people. And to quote him again, the people of East, East Bengal were made insensate by the weight of British imperialism and Brahminism. The foundations of Pakistanism lie in the people's emancipation. In his speech, it is clear that despite the newness of the territorial form of the nation state, uh, the idea of the people as a sovereign force in itself is not new. It had persisted over the centuries, and this popular and moral sovereignty was the language not of the Rashtra, that is the nation state, but of the Jati, the people. Now, I want to contrast these two speeches in order to tease out two conceptions of language politics that emerge within the language movement in this period. One was the understanding of language as Rashtra Bhasha, uh, which is the state language, the official language. The other was a much longer uh, conception of a long cultural process, that is the Jatiya Bhasha, um, the language forged by the people, and it witnessed contestation, deliberation, and the establishment of popular sovereignty over centuries, not only thus in the modern state, but also in feudal polity. And because of lack of time, and I'm happy to discuss in, this in the Q&A, I want to argue, just kind of leave it here, that linguistic nationalism is an inadequate category to describe the multiple processes at work when it comes to this tumultuous years. The process of uh, language reform and reconstruction of Bengali in these years, for instance, um, saw the involvement of several important political figures such as Mullah Akram Khan and Muhammad Choidullah, 
who were, as uh, Bodhrudi Noomar points out, somewhat on the fringes of Muslim League, but who capitulated to the state's co-option of the Bengali language and sought to reform and reconstruct it. Uh, again, this remake of, remaking of language not, was not an easy or a singular process. Linguistic identity was discussed by a number of individuals and organizations, um, such as the Tumuddin Mujlif, constructed and implemented by a number of institutions, such as the Language Reform Committee, uh, the report is on the slide, um, and the Bangla Academy, uh, which was established in 1955. And the discussions ranged from the more Islamicized Tumuddun uh, Taizibi strand of Bengali to writing Bangla in the Arabic script and uh, a conversation that went back uh, into the 1930s to the dropping of letters to make it simpler, which is called Shoj Bangla. And the presumed interlocutors and antagonists at the time were both the hegemonic Bengali Hindus and the Urdu speaking West Pakistanis. What emerges from this history is language caught between the interface of Rashtra, the state, and Jati, the heterogeneous people nations, being ultimately its own sovereign force and dictating the terms of subcontinental politics till 1971. The persistence of the people, that is the Janagon and Jati, as a key category in the metonym of language, moreover, issues a powerful challenge to the idea of both Pakistan as a deracinated Muslim homeland and to the idea that hegemonic institutions, the political philology of state, and scholars' ideologues could control the practices, processes, and the politics of language. The best of them realized that they couldn't, which led to kind of language becoming a central principle of mass politics. Thanks. Manav, you're up next. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, so I am, can everyone hear me? Okay, cool. Yeah, so I'm presenting on the politics and law of Zamindari abolition in East Bengal after the partition. Uh, my present paper in some ways is less a work in progress and more an argument in progress. And it's, and it examines why and how East Bengal was the only province in of Pakistan between 1947 to 1971 <coughs> to abolish Samindari and impose land ceilings after partition. Uh, rather than viewing it as a class struggle, as has been done in other work on this, particularly by Budhudi and Umar, I look at it as part of understanding how British India citizens, British India's partition created new ways of control for minority citizens and their property. Uh, I argue therefore that the state Acquisition and Tenancy Act, which I refer to as the Zamindari Abolition Act, even though that's not strictly true, can also be looked at in communal terms as legislation that was directed against a primarily Hindu class of landowners who owned the vast majority of Zamindari estates in East Pakistan at independence. Now, um, rather, I mean, so Zamindars were both rent originally rent collectors, but also became owners of vast quantities of land, largely because of the permanent settlement, over which they built palatial large bodies. Zamindars were often autocratic. Uh, they served as an extra legal source of authority, using latias, literally bludgeoners, to punish the calcitrant tenants and demanding illegal cesses or abwabs. Uh, the economic downturn of the 1930s, coupled with the increase in electorate that in the 1930s as a result of the communal award in the Government of India Act, gave the Zamindar ten tenant relationship a, definite, a decidedly communal turn. Um, when Pakistan was conceptualized in the 1946 elections and fought for as a peasant utopia, in the words of Tajud al-Islam Hashmi, or the land of eternal Eid, uh, the the Zamindar was pitted very um, obviously against the, the, pop, the proja or the populace. Now, as a result, both the major parties here are in a bit of a bind. The Indian National Congress, which had historically argued for Zamindari abolition, now counted Zamindars as one some of its closest allies in Bengal, and this link with, with capital had, had lasted for a while. Um, the Muslim League, on the other hand, which was in in at least in North India, a Zamindar party now 
started uh, a, a, a pro I mean that a, a pro proja argument. Now, at partition, um, East Bengal was left overwhelmingly rural, and the Pakistan National Congress was the only opposition. Now, at partition, the Pakistan National Congress was significantly marginalized. It was largely identified with upper caste Hindus. Um, it could only muster about 28 seats in the assembly. And as the um, and as members such as uh, Dhirendranath Bhatto, who Ahona referred to, and Gobindulal Banerjee um, referred to uh, the, themselves as an ineffective and permanent opposition. And this was largely because of questions around uh, um, permanent, uh, around, the, around the separate electorate system, which had made the Congress a permanent minority. Um, now, the tenancy bill therefore comes as a result of all these circumstances. Uh, with 124 clauses, this was by far the largest bill in the East Bengal Assembly in the first five years of independence, and the one most exhaustively debated. Um, the bill, however, I'm going to focus on two aspects of the bill, which changed significantly over the course of time. So the bill was first introduced on the 8th of April 1948 by um, Hamidul Haq Chaudhary. Uh, it was later sent to a special committee. There was great discord on what the actual provisions would be. And by the time the bill finally appeared in the winter of 1949, there had been significant changes. I'm going to focus on two different aspects of the bill to point out why the Congress thought it was a communally targeted uh, bill. So the initial process had provided for all estates to be taken over per district in one fell swoop after the preparation of a record of rights. Now, this was this would have had massive economic impacts to the exchequer, and this is linked to the compensation clause that we talk about later. But this would not have opened itself up to charges of discrimination. Chapter 1A of the final draft bill, however, allowed for the summary procedure in which all interests of a particular rent receiver by notification could be taken over on payment of an interim compensation. Now, now this was accompanied by another provision which required when such an estate was identified, any revenue officer could demand records for the estates. Now, records in East Bengali estates, like in most Zamindari estates, were chaotically disorganized, were these records not provided within 60 days, a fine amounting to 10 times the final amount of uh, the annual rent would have to be charged. Um, the Congress, of course, argued with some justification that this would be used to take over the property of the largest landowners, many of whom the vast majority were Hindus, while leaving other layers of intermediaries untouched. And therefore, this amounted to the communal act uh, uh, to, to a communal act of a communal government. Now, this becomes clearer when we look at the idea of compensation. Now, compensation and the and compensation of property rights was one of the few uh, provisions that were uh, rights giving provisions that were given in the Government of India Act of 1938. Uh, when compensation had earlier been spoken of, some zamindars, including Shitangshu Kanto Mukherjee. Uh, the Zamindar of Mukta Gacha estate in Moiman Shingo had early asked for compensation in non-South Asian currency, either bullion, dollars, or gold. Um, While well, the initial bills provided for a graded compensation scheme to be paid to Zamindars in one lump sum, uh, the final scheme actually, uh, based on the fact that Zamindars were often moving across the porous border, had changed significantly. Compensation was now not to be offered on the basis of market value of the property, but on the basis of an annual rent. A graded compensation scheme would now give the smallest Samida 10 times the annual income, going up to twice the annual income in the case of large landowners who had estates that cost that, that gave a revenue of over one lakh rupees a month, rupees a year. This compensation was also now to be given in bonds in 40 annual installments at 3% interests. The Congress again argued that this was a communal measure aimed at hitting uh, Zamindas where it hurt. 
The government, on the other hand, arguing that people that this was because of people constantly migrating across the border and because of the flight of the denudation of East Bengali capital that had happened before and was continuing after partition, the government then played hardball. In fact, one amendment suggested that evacuees zamindars or zamindars whose families who had moved across the border should have their compensation halved. And even this reduced compensation should be treated as evacuee property and therefore not be paid until a final um, inter-dominion agreement had been reached between both countries. Um, the, now, in this, so you see a certain kind of capricious and arbitrary uh, nature of, of, of uh, government, of bureaucracy functioning at all levels. Um, effectively, therefore, this means that the largest zamindar, if I judged evacuee, and evacuee property legislation, as a lot of work has focused, left great discretion on the hands of individual bureaucrats at a variety of levels to do so, would only receive a year's rent, a year's rent as compensation to be paid over 40 annual installments. When congressmen pointed out that this appropriate, that this amounted to an expropriatory legislation, they were taunted by references to Nehru's Zamindari abolition in legislation in their India. I mean, the, the Muslim League specifically referred to the Congress as, uh, as a party that fundamentally was associated with and still linked with India. What did the Congress do then? The Congress knew they had no chance of actually winning this. They therefore resorted to filibustering. Throughout the winter session of 1949, we see hours of hours of Congress members giving expositions both in Bangla and in English on, 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 on various aspects of property, including the right to property in Vedic times, long lectures on the history of communal closeness in rural East Bengal, long lectures of the great things Zamindars have done. And this is ironically coming from a party that has, that, that has opposed, I mean, that had ostensibly opposed Zamindari since the, 1900, since the early 1900s. Nevertheless, however, they could only defer the inevitable. By the end of the 1949 session, the compensation clauses had been pushed through and all opposition amendments had been rejected. There was a blanket rejection of opposition uh, amendments. In fact, whenever there was a vote, there was, there, were ne there was never anybody apart from the 20 opposition members who voted in favor of any of these amendments, often they didn't even go to a vote. It just went to a show of hands. In February 1950, as the House debated the final clauses of the bill, the air seemed electric with tension. Outside the assembly, both, both Bengals were facing the worst communal violence they had since 1946. Hindu migration from East Bengal and Muslim migration from West Bengal was in full swing. Um, Congress members, driven to despair, argued that an international tribunal was needed to address concerns of minority rights in East Bengal. This, not unsurprisingly, prompted a furious reply from the, the government benches about sections belonging to this part of Pakistan who owe allegiance abroad. The last drama of this act, therefore, played out in the courts. Pakistan's constitution with a set of fundamental rights, including a con constitutional right to property. Uh, I'll take two more minutes, please. Uh, was to come into force three weeks before the United Front government announced a taking over of all remaining rent interests. Shitangshu Ajaji's nephew filed a petition in the, in the Dhaka High Court, which meant uh, which led to a set of legal grandees assembling in one of the most high-profile cases that had come about till then. The Zamindars had Prafula Ranjan Das, the brother of Siyad Das, who had uh, fought these cases in India, uh, flown in from Calcutta. The government side included Dennis Pritt, the Labour MP, and A.K. Brohi, the law minister, to come from Karachi. Um, unsurprisingly, the Dhaka High Court and both and the Supreme Court both upheld the appeal to the both upheld the constitutionality of the Act. Uh, the Supreme Court, however, said that the compensation clause was derisory and did amount to expropriatory action. However, given that the legislation had preceded the constitution, the right to property would not be applicable. Um, in conclusion, I, I argue that the act was not a success either in providing land to the tiller or in ensuring more equitable land revenue uh, system. 
uh, larger states continue to be common. If anything, it was only a success in terms of the near complete extension of the Hindu Zamindari elite in East Bengal. And therefore, this can be seen as part of uh, the history of state takeover of minority property in the subcontinent, including in Bengal through the evacuee property regime and later the enemy and Western property regimes. Thank you. Hi, um, I just need to figure out how to share my screen, uh, which I will do. Uh, just bear with me one second. I just, um, I just have some visuals. The PowerPoints don't really tell you much other than um, pictures, but I think it might help if we have any non-South Asians in the audience. Uh, so my paper traces a specific segment uh, within the founding history of Bangladesh, uh, which actually tends to receive limited scholarly attention thus far. This is the role of the first government in Bangladesh, which due to wartime exigencies was formed as a government in exile, even before the Constituent Assembly could meet to undertake the constitution drafting exercise. This particular period should be of interest to legal historians as it points to certain legacies of empire and also decolonization. So to take you back to the 1971 war, and I just have some visuals of maps so we know what we're talking about. Um, so to take you back to the war um, that led to the creation of Bangladesh, it followed a tumultuous 50s and 60s, some of which Ahuna and Manav covered. Uh, the Awami League, uh, which was the Liberation Party, and its leader, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, rose to prominence in the 60s, based on a campaign for regional autonomy, among other things. Uh, these issues prefigured the 1970 elections in Pakistan, in which the Awami League won with majority seats in the National Assembly of Pakistan that was going to be entrusted with the task of drafting a constitution. After several failed attempts to negotiate a power-sharing framework between the political elites, on March 25th, 1971, the state of Pakistan opted for a military response targeting civilians. Uh, the declaration of independence from the Bangladeshi side or the East Pakistani side at the time was immediate. A war ensued for the following nine months and after it had ended on 16 December, 1971, subsequently the founders gave themselves a constitution through a constituent assembly on the anniversary of the um, end of the liberation war. So December, 1972. Um, what is unique about this situation is that the Constituent Assembly and the exiled government were made up of elected members that had won the elections of 1970 from East Pakistan. I can't think of too many instances uh, of that happening other than in South Africa in, in the recent past. Uh, the Constituent Assembly met for the first time in April 1972 amidst uh, chaos of post-war reconstruction, breakdown of law and order, there were pockets of anarchy, militias that needed to be disarmed and fragile political alliances. But all of these not, notwithstanding, the Constituent Assembly were able to complete the task at hand quite swiftly. And today, despite many contemporary political conflicts, this constitution endures no matter the contestation and the, and the attempts to subvert it um, periodically. Quite a lot has been written about the founding history um, and even more has been debated about it. The problem of documentary sources aside, according to, to some scholars, from contesting who made the Declaration of Independence to the number of casualties in the war. There are also competing narratives that involve, for example, highly emotive aspects of the war that range from a glorious campaign of victory against oppression and decentered state narratives, including ethnic cleansing, sexual violence, and so on. There's another strand of scholarship that views the birth of Bangladesh through the lens of international relations, that is against the backdrop of the Cold War, geopolitics and proxy war between India and Pakistan, with little to no role for Bangladeshis themselves. And there is also the near unidimensional narrative that focuses on Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who has been bestowed the title uh, of Bangabundu and the father of the nation. Thus, Bangladesh has a founding father in the singular. Uh, now, in, for example, in the American context, when we talk, talk about founding fathers, we usually, you know, it, it uh, implies a collective as opposed to a singular person. There's no doubt that Sheikh Mujibur Rahman is central to the founding history of Bangladesh. However, between March to December 1971, which was the duration of the war, he was arrested and flown to West Pakistan. 
During this time, the rest of the Army League forces scattered. There was military organization that led to the formation of the Mukti Vahini or the Liberation Forces who fought in the trenches. However, a group of Awami League leaders at the time took an alternative route and formed a government in exile in India. This particular group operated as it would have to facilitate the holding of a constituent assembly. The exiled government played an important role and the main protagonist of this story, Tajuddin Ahmed is conspicuously absent from most historical accounts. Apart from the centrality of Sheikh Mujib's vision of freedom that is central to the Bengali identity, there is also a legal narrative that is embedded in this founding history. Accordingly, the founding moment needs to be understood not just as a product of revolutionary passion, but also pragmatism, because what could be achieved was circumscribed by the realities of the new world. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and Tajuddin Ahmed brought to the founding moment ideational and normative qualities that helped legitimize the new order. So let me clarify what I mean by ideational and the significance of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. In the run up to the war, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and the Bengali identity became synonymous. I cite an example in the paper of one of his historic speeches on the 7th of March, where, where he, in a sweep of history, constructed a Bengali nation that had lost out on constitutional wars in the 25 years since 1947. Some members in the Constituent Assembly later on went even further back and referred to the beginning of Bengali oppression in 1757, when the British claimed Bengal and, to, and also to some of the anti-colonial struggles under British rule. So both Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and later on other Awami League leaders had successfully constructed the idea of a Bengali nation alongside the already prevalent rhetoric of injustice that defined state society relations in Pakistan. Once the war began and the government in exile is formed, Tajuddin Ahmed and the government he led carried forth the symbolism that was created by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, but executed the normative requirements of the revolution. The exiled government was aware of the legal requirements of statehood and the realities of creating a new state in an age of non blue water decolonization, especially given the Biafran movement that failed in Africa almost at the same time. East Pakistan's struggles could have easily been termed as an insurgent movement and was indeed pushed as a civil war in international circles. In fact, uh, the UN recognition for Bangladesh was stalled uh, as partly because of this. So given the world politics at the time, the government in exile needed to plug into the international system of states, which required juridical existence to negotiate with the international community for support. This made legal recognition of the state of paramount importance. But other legal requirements were also followed to the letter, including putting in place an organizational structure and a bureaucracy. So when Tajuddin Ahmed formed the government, he took his entire cabinet that was sheltered in India crossed over to the physical territory of Bangladesh in order to be sworn in. And there is an explanation for this appeal to legalism that we see here. One could be that Tajuddin Ahmed was himself uh, trained in the law. His legal training, uh, his legal examinations were actually um, completed while he was in prison in the 50s for political activism. And there's a curious value that's placed upon legality in the region historically. I use the term legalism here in terms of a conservative commitment to rule abidance and also in terms of its operation as a professional and political ideology with roots in history. I don't have time to go into it, but there are many historical examples descending from the colonial era where rule of law proceduralism, bureaucratization of politics and recourse to courts were strategies that had been typically used to produce legal legitimacy. The National Con both the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League in the ways they organized and connected the center with localities reflected some of these principles. Also, historically, marginalized groups have relied on legalism, not just in British India, but also in the United States. Both Ambedkar and Martin Luther King are cases in point who relied on a rights discourse and wanted group rights to be guaranteed as constitutional rights. Another example of legalism and the exiled government were its meetings with the Bombay Bar Association. This, these meetings discuss the validity of the revolution, bringing home the point that this was not an insurgent government, but a legitimate one. And one final example, members of this government also met with American lawyers uh, who had helped impose an injunction on a weapons shipment from New Jersey to West Pakistan. So as we see, the efforts of the government in exile were attempting to provide a legal basis to the revolution while there was an actual war raging in, in East Pakistan. 
These actions were strategic and helped consolidate the authority of the Constituent Assembly later on to give the people their constitution that further reinforced the legitimacy of the constitution. The elected members of the National Assembly of Pakistan, those who were from East Pakistan, acted as the Constituent Assembly of Bangladesh. Now, constitutional theorists may differ on this point uh, as, to, as to whether or not that was valid, but given the political exigencies, the fact that there were elected representatives certainly reinforced some form of legitimacy. It is also worth noting that as soon as the Constituent Assembly members signed the constitution, they resigned instead of converting themselves into a parliament, which was the case in India. Instead, there was a new election in Bangladesh under the new constitution. Thus, it's worth looking at the legacy of legalism and the agency of the founders when thinking about how the constitution came to acquire political legitimacy in the national imagination. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. So, I mean, thank you. That was, thank you. Thank you to the three presenters. I mean, I, I found um, the discussion very enlightening. So I'm going to do, I'm going to be very brief in my sort of comments and I'm going to turn it over to you. What I thought I would do is I would like just quickly, so I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to read the papers as well. Um, so I had a little bit, and I have this, which are a bit more detailed, but the presentations I thought captured the papers perfectly. Um, so I thought I'd summarize the arguments briefly together um, in a way to open up this conversation um, to, to the audience. There are already questions on the chat and I'm sure the presenters are eager to get to them. Um, but also I wanted to just say that, you know, I, I think an event like this, the 50th anniversary, is a sort of moment of great public interest. And I think what, what events like this should do is sort of open up larger con conversations to bring new perspectives and new thought into um, sort of how we historicize this, this, how we historicize Bangladesh. So 50th anniversary of 71 is an opportunity. And I think um, these papers do provide when considered together uh, ways in which we can re reconceptualize the history of the nation. Um, and they bring very different perspectives. Um, Ohona is locating the nation in, uh, in language politics, in old issues of, um, and, and in the 752 language movement. Um, Manav is locating um, the nation in questions of property and citizenship and agrarian class relations, and doing so through a very understudied topic that I think, um, so I look forward to Manav's larger work on the abolition of Zamindari in East Pakistan. And Cynthia is, is, is I think, um, bringing in a whole new perspective on thinking how we think about the foundation of Bangladesh through constitutionalism and legal formalism, looking at the 70, the government in exile, the Mujib Nagar, Nagar government of 71 as a foundational moment. Um, I'm, I'm totally, I'm very much taken by Ohana's larger argument about the two kind of contradictory politics of language that play out. Um, one, sort of the, the language of the state, um, the political philology of the state, as she calls it, the attempt of the state to co-opt Bangla to, for its own legitimization, for its own purposes. But then against that is the history of language as community, is the history of language as the popular, history of language as lived reality, and a particular Muslim Bengali lived reality of language. And to locate the, I mean, I think this brings a whole, uh, this brings very fresh perspectives to thinking about language politics in the immediate post-partition period. Um, Manav's larger argument about the steady communalization of the Zamindari um, abolition bill, the way in which the act kind of becomes part of a larger um, pan post-partition um, attempt to seize uh, minority property um, is I think persuasive, but it also raises questions about the relationship between agrarian class relations and citizenship. Um, in many ways, it is a continuation of Taj Hashmi's um, older argument of the communalization of class struggle, the way in which agrarian, the, the movements for agrarian e e equitability um, sort of are communalized. Um, and I think one of the things we, need, we can do here is rethink the relationship. I mean, one of the things that amazes me about the Pakistan movement and the Bangladesh movement is the equation of Bengali Muslim and peasant and the equation of economic oppressors as outsiders. Um, so I think, um, you know, there, there is a, a very rich set of questions around property, agrarian class relations, citizenship and nation formation that Manav raises. Um, Cynthia's paper, I think, um, folk, I mean, there's been a lot of literature on the 
um, a lot of scholarship, historical scholarship, celebrating the Indian constitution as this great moment in the you know, world's largest democracy and all of that. But the history of constitutionalism in Bangladesh is, is neglected. And neglected perhaps because we, we have thought about our founding moment, as Cynthia points out, uh, through, through war, through war and the, and the, and the narratives of, of genocide, rape, martyrdom, and sacrifice, and not necessarily through sort of um, legalese and constitutionalism and legal formalism. Um, the larger paper, um, and, in, and in her presentation, Cynthia provides, I think, a longer history of why constitutionalism mattered in British Bengal, in, um, in the Pakistan period, the movement for autonomy. And of course, as she does, I think quite excellently, in the uh, interna internationalization of the liberation war as liberation war, not as civil war, not as insurrection, but as a war by a juridified entity called Bangladesh. Um, so this, I think, um, focusing on juridification is a, a fresh perspective from my, from, from, um, my own uh, knowledge and reading. Um, and I think it's worth thinking about, um, especially because our constitution seems to uh, ring survive. Um, even the most unconstitutional forms of government have found have taken recourse to legalism, formalism, constitutionalism. Um, even military regimes, um, authoritarian regimes, have have garbed, um, have taken on the constitutional garb, and it's worth thinking about why that is the case. Um, so, I mean, I encourage, um, I mean, I, I see lots of questions here and um, uh, they're addressed, uh, some of them are addressed specifically to the presenters, but there's a general question as well about why this panel is not addressing what is often considered the defining kind of discourse of Bangladesh, it's, it's development success story. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to address that, but also I would encourage questions that think um, across these papers um, as, as, as and, 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 and thinks, and then and, and think about how uh, these, these perspectives um, help us reflect and recraft our narratives of Bangladesh um, in public participatory ways in this, in this context where there's a great deal of interest gen generated in this topic by the 50th anniversary. So with that, um, I'm gonna ask the presenters, do they want to address this general question about um, you know, Bangladesh's considerable gains post 71 um, would they have been possible without it? And are we avoiding the term development? And is there a politics to avoiding the term development? Um, so that's the kind of question that I think is broad. Um, the specific questions, um, uh, there's one for, um, for Ahona about uh, why she calls, thinks of linguistic nationalism an inadequate category, um, given um, the history histories of nation formation and language throughout in Europe and in, I'm sure in other places. Um, questions from Manav about whether or not um, the peasant movements of the immediate pre and post partition period, the Tebagha movement, um, the Tanka movement in Northern Mayan whether these were important. Also a question from Manav on, do we need to take on, um, uh, you know, do we need to like have a larger understanding of economic disparity if, um, in order to understand um, the, the, you know, in order to sort of contextualize um, the Zamindari ab abolition bill, um, and and you know I mean okay I'm going to leave it be. There's lots lots more questions, and I'm sure uh, we can start with those and then move on. Uh, however you want to take it, whoever wants to go first. I might start with the development question, um, given that it's such a broad question. I. I mean, it's a counterfactual question, right? We just we just don't know. Like the entire sort of um, some of the some of the kind of grievances were to do with participation in government, uh, were to do with representation in government, were to do with how much East Pakistan was getting a share of the of the development efforts in in Pakistan, and we just we just don't know. Um, but having said that, you know, Bangladesh has made considerable gains. Uh, some of those gains uh, might be attributed to the kind of development regime that we have in place. But I think a large part of it is also attributed to the people of Bangladesh, despite the myriads of problems in governance that we've had uh, since 1971. Um, so, so perhaps, you know, the state 
structure and that architecture um, poses problems and, and you know, the people persist uh, despite of it. Uh, so, I mean, you know, if you credit the people, then it may have been possible, you know, who knows? <laughs> but uh, certainly the, the development progress that Bangladesh has, has made, um, all credit goes to the people, certainly. Thank you. I'm sorry, Anna. Um, yeah, I, you know, this is to address the question of the inadequacy of uh, linguistic nationalism. Um, so I think that the whole question of Rashtrabhasha, um, it did emerge before um, 47. But uh, for instance, the question of Rashtrabhasha was raised, um, I think, in the 20s. Um, and there was an argument that actually our Arabic is like the Rashtrabhasha of, of Muslims. Um, and of course, the idea of Bangla as Rashtrabhasha is something that's uh, a very uh, phenomenon that happens in the 40s, uh, especially kind of from 1947. Um, the Jatiya Bhasha question is a much longer kind of formulation. I think that's what really interested me. Um, because the you know Jati, which I translation as uh, which I which I translate as people. Um, is actually a kind of very fluid understanding of a people nation in which the contours of the people keep changing over the course of the early 20th century. So before the separatist movement, the Jati, you know, sometimes refers to the Bengali Muslim people nation, but most times it includes the Hindus as well. And I, my, the main kind of uh, thrust of my uh, longer project is really thinking about the Hindu Muslim political relationship um, and how the formation of nation states kind of affects that. Um, but going back to the question of Jati, I mean, uh, a piece that has really uh, stayed with me um, um, when it comes to thinking about the Jati is uh, an essay by Anisu Zaman, which he wrote, uh, I think, in the 90s. Uh, which was called uh, Bangladesh Bangali, um, Bangali and anyway, the name escapes me right now, but he made a, a, a posited a distinction which was made in the political rhetoric in the 1990s, where, which was Bengali versus Bangladeshi distinction. And in his analysis, the term Bengali was this long standing uh, non-sectarian and anti-parochial formulation and was always the expression of this pluralistic and diverse collective. Um, and that Jati Gato Shatta, which kind of transcended the limitations of nation states was the, was the kind of essence of um, the language movement and also in some ways the essence of 1971. Um, and in that um, there were no others because literature and language is inherently kind of universalist. And that's why I think that on going on down that road, um, I would rather think about these many contestations um, and, um, and unities as well as contradictions that the politics of language kind of um, term encompasses and that linguistic nationalism does not. Um, okay. Um... I'm going to answer the questions. Thank you so much for these questions and thank you so much for your very insightful comments, Tariq. This is very, very useful as I as I figure out how to fit this later. Um, so Nafis, your question is very interesting and I've been thinking about it myself. Uh, so it's so the peasant rebellions uh, don't really come to court as such. But they're significant in some ways and not significant in others in, in this. And, and so, so they're very significant in terms of the kind of alliances that are created. And, and, this, and this links to Tariq's point about Bengali Muslims being identified with the peasants. So the, in, the, in the East Bengal Assembly in the 1940s and 50s, the Congress is the only religious opposition but the SCF, the Scheduled Caste Federation, is firmly with the government, and that's partly because of the impact of the of the Tebaga and the Tonka movements. Um, now, in the Legislative Assembly debates, uh, these are the you know like the the Tonka policy and the Tebaga Andolan are 
significant in terms of rhetoric and they're used by both the Congress and the Muslim League. But ultimately, the legislation as it was finally drafted, and this is what I, I don't think I, it, it came out well because of lack of time, the legislation actually doesn't really, doesn't allow the, the tenant to become the owner. There was a provision in Hamidul Haq Chaudhary's bill in 1948, which the special committee then removes and the Muslim League removes. And, and so as a result, you know, it's kind of the peasant uh, doesn't become that significant. In, and, and so the Tebhaga Andolan kind of gets sidelined in this whole, in, in this whole question uh, because it, it does end up becoming a religious, um, it, it, it has a serious religious connotation. Um, in court, as it happens, the Tebhaga Andolan doesn't really get mentioned at all except in terms of saying that, you know, the legislature has taken account of circumstances on the ground. And that's, and that's partly, I think, because... First, I mean, I think partly it's because of who actually gets access to court and, and how the constitution gets abrogated very quickly. And so by the early 60s, the whole liberal rights-based promise of the, of the constitution has kind of faded after Ayub's second constitution comes up. Uh, so I think that's, that's kind of the answer that it's it's significant in some ways, but also not really significant when the legislation is being drafted or when these matters are being dealt with in court. Um, uh, Ananta, thank you for your question, actually. Uh, and yes, uh, the paper has actually taken account of, of uh, in industrial development or lack thereof in East Bengal in the 1940s. Now, the thing with jute is that jute actually was not really grown very much in the zamindari in the in the in the region around the zamindars which is under the zamindars um and uh and you do mention that um that uh, you know after the emergence of bangladesh and independence so so basically what i wanted to say was that one of the reasons why the zamindars were being actually offered compensation and one of the arguments in favor of a liberal regime of compensation for zamindars was that they would invest in industrial development in East Bengal, particularly in the jute industry, and therefore rival and, and therefore allow the jute industry in, in East Bengal to come up and prevent uh, East Bengal, West Bengal from being dependent on prevent East Bengal from being dependent on the West Bengal market. And this becomes particularly significant when the compensation clauses are discussed, because this is also happening at exactly the point that the that the uh, you know the, the trade agreement has gone awry with India. India has devalued its currency. Pakistan hasn't, and so and so one of the arguments against comp both in favor of compensation being given to the rehabilitated zamindars, but also against compensation being given to zamindars is is linked to the jute industry. Because the argument uh, in favor is that they could invest in the jute industry in East Bengal. The argument against is that as they, as they have bank accounts in East in West Bengal, and as they keep moving towards West Bengal, they will use whatever they will continue to use whatever compensation they get and invest it in India. So that's the the answer I have to to that question. Um, uh, Afia. Uh, thank you for your question. So the evacuee property regime is kind of interesting because it works very differently on both sides of the border. In on the eastern, on, on the western border, evacuee property also becomes a way of compensating those who've crossed the border. Uh, in the eastern border, that doesn't happen partly because migration doesn't really happen in in quite this the the quasi symmetrical way it happens in the west. Uh, so. So evacuee property then is a way of the state to take over the prop to take over minority property, but it doesn't. It is not used as part of a compensation pool for uh, for minorities on for, for for the majority who's emigrated from the other community on both sides. Um, so and then of course later in 1965, you have the the evacuee property regime ends and the enemy property regime takes over. Um, well, the idea of like one country's act that is better than the other is is kind of uh, 
controversial, right? Because both of them, both evacuate property acts on both sides of the border are actually a, a mirror image of the other because they're waiting for the for the final inter-dominion settlement that never really happens. But what actually Bangladesh does do is that in the early 2000s, it actually comes up with a law under the Vested Property Act, which is what the Enemy Property Act is renamed, which actually allows theoretically for the property of restoration to Hindus who actually haven't gone. So if I were to, I mean, so so definitely that is that is a major difference from both India and Pakistan. Uh, and I think maybe that's also because of the way in which Bangladeshi nationalism is constructed. Um, can there be, is there an international court? Well, there could be. The problem with international law as such is that you usually need countries, the, the consent of countries to actually go there. And it becomes very hard in these kind of situations. Uh, so yeah. Um, do I have? Maybe Cynthia can take uh, her two questions, and I'm sure questions will keep rolling. You do have more, Manav, uh, including. Yeah, um, I, I, so there were some questions. Uh, someone asked why compare with uh, Biafra and not Eritrea and South Sudan. Uh, that would be a totally different paper. So I discussed Biafra um, only in the context of the chronological time, because the Biafra movement had failed. Um, almost contemporaneously to the to the war, uh, which is why I brought up Biafra just as a reference point. Um, also, there's someone else who pointed out about uh, no organized military that was available at the onset of the liberation war. Um, so I, you know, I apologize if it came across that way because yes, there were defecting Bengali officers from the Pakistani army who formed the different forces. Uh, however, um, I'm very explicit in the paper that the paper is not about the Mukti Bahini. So I, I explicitly focus on the on the government in exile and not the Mukti Bahini. Um, you may want to read up on Afsan Choudhury's work, who is probably the authority um, on, on, on the actual war. Um, and also someone asked the last question, which is uh, how problematic was the personification of power and the identity and mythology of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman? for the democratic institutionalizing of power in Bangladesh. Um, I think in terms of uh, democratic institutionalization of power in Bangladesh, it has happened. 1991 is an example when it did happen. Um, in so far as uh, in sort of, you know, the cult of personality is concerned, everybody does it. Every election, if, if parties happen to alternate, our, the names of our airports change, the names of our roads change. Uh, so, so there's kind of rebranding of, of the national identity. Um, so, you know, I think we should separate the two because democratic institutionalization is possible and it has happened. Um, and, you know, we, we have to be optimistic that it will happen again. Um, so I think I'll, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Ona, you have a question from Priyanka Boshu. Um. So regarding the question about the present uh, political climate, uh, Priyanka, um, I do think that it's very interesting that there is this um, kind of borrowing of rhetoric from the language movement. Um, but of course, the thing about the present Indian political climate is that there are many kind of, because of the nationwide you know, imposition of Hindi, there are many kind of regional linguistic oppositions to that. Um, but I actually wanted to kind of go back to the question of Shubdha Bangla that you raised, um, which is the kind of standardized, uh, uh, the standardized Bangla of the 19th century. Um, I think one thing that I found very interesting when I was writing my dissertation and as I'm kind of rewriting my book, is the whole question of the use of uh, Persian and Arabic words and the balance of them in terms of establishing uh, Muslim identity. And I, I feel that in, in the first few decades of uh, the 20th century, the whole uh, foundations of uh, Shuddha Bangla were kind of uh, resisted and, and, and rewritten um, by uh, Bengali Muslims. And of course that happened uh, in a completely kind of uh, uh, astonishing way with uh, Nodrul's corpus and, and Nodrul is a poet that we uh, both have in common when it comes to research. Um, but this whole 
you know, balance of words and the Perso Arabic words versus the kind of Sanskritized uh, Shadhu Bangla um, is, has, has a very interesting and very different life also after 1947, right? Because then turning to the Shadhu Bangla is again a kind of expression of Bengaliness. And, and th these kind of shifting contours of the same debates um, over uh, successive decades, I think is a, is, a, is a really kind of interesting phenomenon um, because then the kind of state and the politics kind of really has a determining hand um, in, in kind of establishing standard version of the language. Manav, do you want to say anything about the garments boom in Bangladesh? Um, the what the sorry, I haven't seen this question. Um, where, where is it? Oh, is it gone? It was the current uh, from Ananta Krishnan. Current boom in garment and textile industry in Bangladesh also has historical root then. Um, I mean, I mean, actually, for that, I think my answer would be similar to the answer you gave in the conclusion of your book, which is basically that. It, it does in some ways, it, of course, it links to an even older history, like it links to the whole idea of, of Muslim from Dhaka, but it also links to, uh, uh, you know, like the economic boom of East Pakistan in the 50s as coming from Jute. Uh, but it's also different in the sense that there is that that the whole Jute thing was both statist and indigenous in a way that the cotton industry isn't. So, I mean, it does have root. I mean, I, it, it has similarities, but it's not really the same, I would say. Um, I guess uh, while we um, maybe, I mean, I, I think I want to just say a few things about why um, there's so many questions on why we aren't talking about women's empowerment, why we're not talking about economic development, health and education, population control. And I think I do want to say that in many ways, um, the Bangladesh discourse has been dominated by the development discourse, which I think is reflected in much of the uh, lit uh, much of the sort of uh, what what we might call uh, the popular coverage, right? The Economist's coverage or the you know the, the popular press coverage is look how far Bangladesh has come. What the Economist titles are from rags to stitches, right? Which is um, typical of the Economist and its clever wordplay. Um, and I do think that. This is a good opportunity, perhaps, to think of different histories, to think of language and what language means in a, in a country like Bangladesh and the history of that, to think of property not as economic development, but property as citizenship and belonging, to think of constitutionalism not as promoting growth and prosperity, but to think of it as a set of state practices that are inculcated and developed. I think these perspectives that we're getting I mean, it's not to say that we don't think of those questions, but rather that we kind of broaden. I think this is perhaps, a. I mean, Bangladesh's development might mean that this is the moment to broaden it as well. Um, it might mean that we stop defining our understanding of Bangladesh through um, sort of the sort of stages developmental model um, that has been presented to the third world as the way to understand its post-colonial history, but to think of our post-colonial history through other terms, through other concepts. And I think what the presenters have done today quite brilliantly is suggest what those other places might be. Um, and I, and, and that's, that, that's my kind of sentiment on, on that. Um, how, I mean, I mean, Shermin Ahmed has this question about, um, you know, the principles of equality, social justice, and human dignity. And I think what we're talking about when we talk about development is the sort of aspirations of that moment in 71. Um, the aspirations, which were, I think, very broad, very complex. And I think there is a way in which to think about those aspirations without reducing it to economic indicators. Um, so with that, I'm just going to like turn it back and we're going to, I guess, wait for more questions as they come. Um, there is a question from Priyanka um, Zilstra. And maybe Ahona, you want to address that, or maybe all the speakers want to address that, um, the role of gender. Um, we can talk about gender. I think one of the ways, one of the things we haven't talked about in any of those papers is the question of gender. Um, so I think this is a good moment to think of gender. Um, there's also a question about women's empowerment and gender parity um, and how we, we're not addressing that. And I think this, this is perhaps related to that. 
I'm going to think a little bit about it because most of the philologists that I work on are men. Um, and um, in terms of writer, I mean, I think that, um, so I study these old um, periodicals um, uh, in, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And uh, there are Hindu periodicals and there are Muslim periodicals and, and Mus Muslims writing in the more Hindu periodicals and vice versa. But I feel that um, in you know, just talking about uh, very important figure in that history is Begum Rukeya and also the very important impact that she had on Bangla literature in the early 20th century. Also in terms of kind of both Hindu and Muslim questions of gender, role of women in forging this new kind of 20th century uh, literary public space. Um, so, you know, but that's definitely a question that I'm going to think about more. I think with regards to, uh, I mean, I can only say in relation to what I've presented. Um, so not in the exile government, um, but in the actual constituent assembly, you know, there, there was representation of women. So it wasn't just all sort of these founders who were men but there were also very vocal, you know, elected uh, MPs. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, and, and they were very forthright and vocal about, about the provisions that they wanted in the constitution. Uh, and some of which was actually reflected, even the drafting committee, which was a smaller committee that undertook the, the exercise of actually drafting the constitution. Um, even, even, even in that there was gender representation, um, you know, with regards to, women's empowerment and development. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in development, so I'm, I'm just going to leave it at the, the Constituent Assembly. Um, there's one question that somebody's asked on the chat, and which is about the preamble, which my paper actually uh, peripherally kind of refers to. Um, sorry, Tariq, are you saying something? Because I, I can't hear you. OK. So, um, so yeah, these are the four principles of nationalism, socialism, democracy, and secularism. Um, I think, I mean, as a lawyer, certainly these have interpretive significance uh, for the court and judicial decisions. Uh, and I think the, perhaps it was in some ways uh, good that it was left generic, uh, the nature of these concepts, because if, if, if it's too, if it's too rigid and if it's spelt out, then it's the court's job to interpret that. So at least from the standpoint of, of a lawyer, um, I, th I think it has worked well on, on sort of specific constitutional issues, uh, whether that's religion, uh, you know, even gender. So there are lots of examples. Um, socialism, again, I mean, that we're very far away from being a socialist state. But certainly in terms of uh, secularism, democracy, um, these have had uh, significant interpretive significance for court decisions. So I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, uh, yeah, so the, the question of gender is, is quite interesting in my research and also it's something that kind of that the I mean by the very nature of the archive I've used for this both the court and um, legislative assembly debates it's kind of sidelined um, one but I mean of course women were very prominent in the in the assembly and in the debates around uh, the Zamindari bill so Asha Lata Sen was one of the people who was uh, arguing for uh, Zamindari to be abolished without compensation, as was Anwara Khatun. And Anwara Khatun also said that, you know, it's, it's uh, and, and clearly said that the, the problem with the Zamindari system and the division of these, of these estates is that women don't really find a, a role there. The other person who was very, very vocal, and I think like, she, like her, her career, I think in the Indian National Congress has been studied, but her career in East Pakistan hasn't. And it should be is uh, the member from Chittagong, Nelly Sengupta. So Nelly Sengupta actually argues, uh, uses a variety of arguments in favor of either abolishing Zamindari without compensation completely, 
or with fair compensation and not with this half pay house so i mean well in terms of the representation of women in the assembly there's certainly that happening but i and i need to think through you know how uh, property and 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 like the, the institutions i mean that the and and women link uh, and and the whole question of gender link so i need to think through that through i think but these are the ways in which i can try to address this in the course of what i've done so far um when wider questions about evacuee property of course um there, there's this whole idea because because women uh, the domicile of women is linked to their husbands and uh, uh fathers uh, so that becomes a way by which women are deprived of, of access to their property and their citizenship even when they're staying in a particular place by virtue of their of, of their either their father or their husband shifting and and that becomes a way by which a lot of women are have their property taken away in a lot of cases uh, men try to leave the women behind in and and a lot of the acquisition of houses cases in the early 50s deal with this so he like these are the these are the ways in which i need to think this through certainly i mean i'll just i mean cynthia i think you have a couple of questions for you and i'll let you answer i just want to add to manav's response that um the largest zamindari in east pakistan at the time of the abolition bill is the chakla roshanabad zamindari um held by the by by tripura by the state of tripura who is now ruled then ruled by a very remarkable woman the maharani of of tripura so woman zamindar is 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 key and um to go along with what manav said about the bakri property rights i've been doing some research on um the post 1950 legislation for hindus to regain their property that they had left in the violence and in so many of these instances there is a widowed elderly relative who's kept in the village while they have been living um in calcutta or in west bengal for a long period of time and i think that sort of gender angle is just fascinating i don't know what i mean so that's just my two bits cynthia i think you have two questions for you from niti nair and and i think um you you can at least i mean afia's question is perhaps broader but perhaps um the issue of secularism the constitu in the constitution and how that plays out um in terms of in terms of women and and history is something maybe you can address need that so um the question about the the constituent assembly going in for fresh elections um uh, again goes back to the issue of legal validity um i think to avoid questions about whether or not the constituent assembly that was elected in pakistan but then there's this legal kind of uh, creation of a new state and you still have uh the same constituent assembly acting as the parliament for the new state Uh, i think that would have raised uh, certain questions about legal validity and uh, certainly i think awami league had uh, good lawyers uh, who probably devised the solution um, or or at least you know even within the cabinet uh, this may have been this may have been a question about validity and and you know lo and behold the election results when it came back uh, which was overwhelmingly you know awami league won with landslide uh, results and so um i think that uh, it reinforced kind of our league or helped our league also consult, consolidate its political position in the in the sort of new legal order of bangladesh um and the second question is how has the focus on a legal constitutional basis during the formation of bangladesh steered its subsequent political outlook um so i think in terms of legalism um as i said it's there's a long tradition in south asia um so if you look at um military governments in bangladesh so uh, between so roughly 74 onwards till about 1990 uh, there were various forms of authoritarian governments there was martial law periodic martial law um imposed uh, on on the country and so a lot of these times uh, so unlike other places uh, you know the constitution was not abrogated so if you look at pakistan in the 60s the constitution was completely abrogated but instead these military dictators um sort of pre 1990 what they had opted for uh, was to uh, amend the constitution as opposed to so they kept they kept the original constitution intact right and and you have to ask yourself why would you do that why not just abrogate it because clearly the military has kind of sweeped in and 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 assumed power over everything uh so i think again it goes back to the legitimacy question because 
uh, even at various times that the military has operated, so both the Bangladeshi Nationalist Party and the Jatiya Party, which uh, was founded by two military dictators, they had formed their own political parties. Again, again, there's a garb of kind of political legitimacy that they've always tried to attempt to do. So I hope that sort of answers the question. Um, in terms of secularism, um, so I think the, the kind of score when it comes to secularism, it's, there's been back and forth. Like we've, there's been progress on one end and then not so much progress on the other end. Uh, not too long ago, the courts had to consider the, the issue of secularism because Bangladesh, there is, a, there, there is a contradiction in the constitution now, right? So you have secularism in the preamble, but then Islam is also a state religion. And I think the court kind of sidestepped the issue, didn't really want to rattle uh, sort of Islamic groups. Um, so, you know, but if, in, when it comes to, you know, if women's groups go to court in terms of judicial remedies, uh, whether that's to, you know, issues of, of mandating, making burqas mandatory in schools, for example, there was a case not too long ago, um, you know, the court has been very forthright when it comes to women's empowerment cases. So if there's, an, there, if there's an, a constitutional issue that involves gender, um, generally the courts tend to be receptive. And, and I think that the, pre, the principles that are enumerated in the preamble have facilitated uh, when, when it comes to interpreting um, those issues. So I'll just uh, stop there, thank you. There's just, there's another question from you. Um... Uh, right below that is uh, the is that no the fact that Bangladesh adopted a constitution so quickly um, is does that mean that the constitution is less rooted or has less um, because there was so, there wasn't a su sufficient public debate around constitution making it happened so quickly and in such a time of chaos does it result in an inadequate public understanding of the constitution. So this was this was an issue even in the Constituent Assembly debates. So there was actually um, only a hand. I think there were three um, kind of independent uh, Constituent Assembly members, and Shuranji Chengupta was one of them, who was also a Hindu uh, minority. Um, so you know his position was, why not wait and circulate for opinion? Um, you know, it would only make the draft better. Um, and, you know, he was very vehement in his protests that it should be. So there, there's this long kind of drawn out debate in the Constituent Assembly uh, between Shuranji Chengupto and between Kamal Hussain um, about why or why it should not be circulated. And it was, I mean, there were, um, you know, newspaper sort of published parts of the Constituent Assembly debates as it was occurring. But I think uh, much of it was political exigencies at the time. Much of it was, you know, as I, as I said in the paper, uh, you know, there were sort of militias that needed to be disarmed. There was post-war reconstruction. And I think a lot of it had to do with, they just wanted to get on with kind of putting the state together. Um, and, and I think that uh, this decision later on when they had the elections, um, and they said, I think at one point in the closing debates, they were like, well, this is one example in South Asia. People don't normally want to give up power. But here, you know, the entire Constituent Assembly resigns and opts for a new election. So I think that kind of balanced out the, the swiftness with which the Constitution drafting took place. Thank you. Perhaps I, I would, I think all of the panelists can address from their perspectives, the question from Noor Kazi, is Bangladesh a subaltern state created by a generation of subaltern people of East Bengal? I mean, I can, I can, I mean, I mean, it seems to me that Ona's concept of popular language and sovereignty has something to do with, and maybe she'll speak about that more. I think the question of peasant and landlord has something to do with, and she can speak about it more. And I think the question of constitutionalism as founding of the nation, it speaks to a subalternist idea that the nation is a betrayal of the people. I mean, it's 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 not founded in in the popular, in the but in the legalese and the formal, right? That's the moment of arrival in part the strategy sort of foundational text. Um, so I think all of you do have perspectives, and maybe you can elaborate. 
Well, I could, you know, take a stab at it. It's a difficult, uh, definitely a very difficult question. Um, but with respect to my own paper, I feel that, um, and I've been thinking about this for a while, like what is exactly the difference between an elite language um, and the language of the people? Is it a question of um, the state and its institutions which um, uphold um, the elite language? Um, but it's not that you know, the state and its ideologues are always consistent. And in my, the longer paper that I had sent to Tariq, in fact, I talked about how Muhammad Shoidullah, who is at that point of time, an important um, uh, figure in the political milieu, um, member of the Language Reform Committee, and then kind of a very important figure in the history of the Bangla Academy, um, went against some of the things that he was writing at the time to say that, you know, that beyond being Hindu and Muslim and all of the markers that mark you know, physical markers that kind of show us as distinctly Hindu or Muslim, there's language which transcends all of that. So again, I mean, that I've, that's another question that I've been thinking about that that in this kind of the first seven years, I feel that there is a lot of co people are co-opted, but not always convinced um, that they work within the institutions of the elites without feeling um, absolutely ideologically aligned with the things they say or the things they have to do. And nowhere else is this contradiction of um, state and, and nation of the mind and the heart more visible um, than language, which captures all of the different aspects of identity and, and the disconnect between what one has to say and what one feels and what one has to do um, and what one doesn't want to do. So that's my answer, I think. Um, yeah, this is an interesting and, and as Ahuna said, a very hard question to answer. Um, I feel like I mean, if I were to link this to my research and to what I think it's, I, I feel like both the, you know, the, the creation of East Bengal and the creation and East Pakistan and the creation of, of Bangladesh later are both moments where of, of a subaltern of an oppressed class kind of trying to push back. So I feel like that is definitely true in some ways. Uh, in terms of the self-conception of the country. Uh, so yeah, that, that's basically my two bits. I think uh, the subaltern collective uh, would completely disagree with my paper uh, because you know law is, is viewed as an instrument of power. And so, uh, you know, you have, you know, if you if you were to view the state from a subaltern perspective, then this is a bourgeois constitution, no doubt about it. Um, so I think in terms of, but you know, it, I can I can highlight some of the discussions in your constituent assembly debates. Uh, you know, so socialism, for example, um, also in terms of rule of law. So you know, a lot of the some of the constituent assembly members, including Tajuddin Ahmed, uh, they actually looked at the court as an institution of power and uh, felt that the people had no access to this institution. And I think this was true in Pakistan, this was true in colonial India. So I think this was no different in Bangladesh. And um, they, they viewed socialism as a kind of stepping stone to a more uh, equal society. Uh, so, but none of these principles were rigid, so to speak. Um, and in terms of, um, it's, it's difficult to view a government as, as subaltern uh, because a, a lot of these uh, protagonists of this history uh, came up as counter elites. So, right, so they weren't necessarily subaltern. Uh, I, I, I would term them as counter elites. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna leave it there, thank you. So let us uh, maybe give people a couple of minutes if they're for a last round of questions, um, perhaps. And if there are none, um, maybe I can ask you guys to um, just kind of say a few words to sum up. And then I think Debbie will come in and make a statement, but we'll just give people a couple of minutes because we have another half an hour, I think, right? Uh, 
Is that right? Um, so we do have a question from, I mean, we just wait for a few more and then start taking them. Perhaps the first question from Sadia um, Ahmed. Ahana, you want to take that? Um, actually, I think that's a really wonderful question because this kind of march to monolingualism that happened um, is, it did create a lot of exclusions in terms of not just other languages or you know, indigenous and ethnic identities, um, but also in terms of what indeed would finally be the Bangla that is spoken and written and, and, and printed. Um, and I've thought about this at length in terms of this whole question of history of language, because, you know, when philologists, uh, scholars, writers were writing earlier in the late 19th or early 20th century, um, the, this kind of pre-colonial, the vestiges of pre-colonial uh, multilingualism still remained. Um, and in terms of not just knowing a bunch of languages, but also in terms of uh, not knowing that those languages are not being constrained in terms of one's religious uh, identity as well. Um, so for instance, uh, Persian literature and, and the Persian language is still written about with a lot of wistfulness and nostalgia by Hindu writers right till the end of the 19th century, including Tagore's father, Devin, Devindranath. Um, well, it's kind of not as well known, but before Nodru started writing Ghazal's, um, Chotendra Nadotto had also written Ghazal's and had written on writing Ghazal's. Um, and this kind of, uh, kind of fluidity, this is I kind of ascribe to, to Jati, but the, the fluidity of different forms of expression, uh, different forms of literature, um, different linguistic registers, there is a flattening, obviously, with the whole question of um, the new nation state and what and how language can uh, be formulated within these parameters. Um, and I mean, just in terms of one language itself, a kind of monolingualism is damaging indeed. And I think that is an important um, thing to remember. Cynthia, you want to take Sharmina Ahmed's question? So in terms of the first government, um, most of, at least in the English language, most of what I've found has been um, peripheral. Uh, I know Mohud Ahmed's book um, offers an account, not a very flattering account of the first government of Bangladesh. Um, and and uh, much of it is peripheral discussion. Uh, I think Amirul Islam may have recently written something, um, but in you know there are some sources in the vernacular, most of which tend to be memoirs, um, and some of it oral history. Um, I'm, I'm yet to find significant sources, so I'm I'm going to say no, um, and and hopefully you know this would be a good intervention um, in the field, writing about this. Thank you. Um, and does anyone want to take Noor Kazi and Ananta Krishnan's questions about Hashani and um, sort of left politics in Bengal? I wish Laili was here to answer that question, but um, but um, but does anyone want to take take a question about the significance of left parties? I mean, I, I mean, in, in fairness, maybe to the presenters, uh, you know, not everyone can do everything about the past. Um, and I think there are historical specializations, um, but maybe Manav's work, um, I mean, the, the Zamindar abolition bill as it was passed was a betrayal of the left parties by um, the rightist Muslim League, right? It's the right party, the right wing party that passed the bill and implemented the bill. Um, Oh, we, we, we have been invited away. We, we are out of time, which we scheduled in at 12.30. So I'll just leave that with the left parties. And I'm going to ask, um, I think we're out of time. So I guess unless the presenters want to 
um, say a few words. I'll ask Debbie to um, come in and um, finish us off. Oh, thank you. Um, that concludes our conversation today. Sorry, we went a little over time. Uh, recording of this webinar will be available on the AHA's YouTube channel shortly. Um, and thank you again to our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. Thanks to everyone who submitted questions. This was obviously a really lively, uh, engaging conversation. Um, and uh, finally, a special thanks to the panelists today. Have a great day. Thank you very much.